Well, good afternoon. We've been taking a look at lessons coming out of the book of James. That little book has so many uh, great uh, lessons that we can pull from it, looking at the idea of how we individually and personally, it's a very personal type of a book, and helpful in helping us to look at ourselves, to evaluate the way we're handling uh, strife and problems, and really self-control, and how to mature, how do we grow up. We always look at people sometimes, we, we, we just want to tell them, you know, you just got to grow up, come on. Spiritually, it's the same thing. He gives us some great advice. He's already gone through. He's talked about how that we, we look at uh, persevering, how we need to ask for wisdom. We need to understand where sin comes from, that it's not from God, that it comes from within. Talked about faith and action, that faith, we have to be able to be action and take that, what we believe in, what we've heard, and do something with it. And then he come last week, we looked at the idea of the tongue. <laughs> You know, we all, we've all seen people who have lost control. We have lost control. We've said things at times, and, and the danger of it. You can't undo those things. I used to tell my boys, I used to tell them, you know, they would say things to one another, and i go, you know, the words out of your mouth mean something to somebody. You know, because I've, I've kind of heard that. Well, that didn't mean anything. Uh, you, you, you know, well, it meant something to somebody because they heard it. And, and the way you say it, they understand it. Those words have meaning to them. And so we have to be able to control our tongue. And I know we have problems with that. So now look at that as he continues with this. He started out in verse 1 by saying, not many of you should be teachers. Why? Well, he says, we, and he includes himself, and he says, because we are going to incur a more strict judgment. And that is true. And that is kind of one of the most frightening things that I have, that I thought about. And even when I, would, uh, when I first started teaching Bible class, and then started preaching, it really made me nervous because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm standing up here and I'm teaching, you know, something that's not mine. It's not just another person, but this is God's. And so what if I get it wrong? And I had one elder tell me, he goes, uh, well, the fact that you're, you're, you're wrestling with that probably means you're okay. <laughs> if you're concerned about it, it's the people who don't. You know, there, there are some we know shouldn't be teaching. They, you know, they just don't have, and that's all right. You know, there's other things that they can be doing. Not everyone needs to be a teacher. And then there's some that should be teaching that have that potential. But if we start to teach, we understand what's our main instrument. The tongue. It's what we're using. And so with that same tongue, if we, if we try to bring in our ego, if we don't have control of our own emotions, and we're not very spiritual, that tongue is going to unleash a lot of garbage with it. As we teach, and that's one of the dangers that was going on. That one, one danger was what well, was actually happening. There were teachers who were trying to inject their own ideas about Mosaic law and impose that on top of the gospel and teaching that, yeah, Christ is good, and you need baptism, but you also need to have circumcision. And so that was a type of initial conflict that they were having. And we see that a lot that happens. It's a good advice, the type that we need to understand. The idea that our tongue. You know, we can, we can turn around and say something very pleasant and be really nice and, you know, oh, you're so, oh, Jack, I love, you know, you're a great guy. And then turn right around and look at somebody else and unleash some, some terrible comments or thoughts about that person. And well, we call that a hypocrite. We call it gossip. And, you know, it's okay as long as we're doing it, but when it comes at us, then it's something else, isn't it? And he says, that's, that's just messed up. I mean, it's just kind of wrong. How can you sit and come to church Praise God, sing these songs out, and then turn around and look at somebody, and then in your, your mouth, you open up, well, I wonder what Sister Bones so was doing, or Brother So-and-so, and we start, he said, that's just, that's just not right. It cannot happen. So what does that mean? If we don't have control of our tongue, we are not spiritual. In other words, you can't have a spring, like he said, having fresh water and salt. And, you know, you can't, it's always going to be salt, isn't it? Especially like fresh water. Fresh water, you're going to be able to have fresh water. But if you all of a sudden start flowing salt water and then back to fresh water and then back to salt water, what do you have? You have salty water. Period. You can't say, well, wait a minute. That was some fresh water I had there going. Mm, guess what? No. And that's the same thing with us. Don't think that we can turn around and, you know, praise God and be all glorious and wonderful and loving and then turn around and say things that aren't fit, that aren't spiritual, that aren't loving, that aren't kind. It contaminates and pollutes us completely spiritually. And he said it's, it's wrong. And so now, where do we get our wisdom from? 
Wisdom is something we all love to have. We want. We look at Solomon. When I hear the word wisdom, I think of this young man that his father David set a really high level of standard to, to take over and to rule behind him. The whole transition of him becoming a king was amazing because, one, he wasn't the one by birthright that should have come along. It's always the oldest surviving son. And at that point, it wasn't him. He was just a young kid. Uh, you know, like 18 or 19, you know, young. And he comes along and then he goes out to worship God and goes down and he's offering sacrifice and he has a dream. And in that dream, God says, Solomon, Solomon, what, what do you want? Ask it and I will give it to you. And, if, and I've always just kind of paused there and thought, I want to never have to worry about my health again. I think to myself, I never want to have to worry about money. Don't give me a lot, but just give me enough to where I'm just always going to be comfortable. That, you know, I can take it easy, whether I'm struggling, I'll always be fine. I can think of a lot of things like that. I can think of a lot of things that a king, a young man, to do that. But what was his mindset? He said, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. The other thing is, it's never too late to ask for it. At the very beginning of the book, isn't that what he started out with? Then when we're going through trials and hardships, and we pray for wisdom, not, you know, what's that wisdom? That ability to take the knowledge and apply it appropriately. And so he said, Lord, give me wisdom to lead. And in another part of that statement I love is he says, your people. Not, you know, a king, those are my people. So, those, that, that, so when I think of wisdom in the Bible, I, I just go to Solomon. But now, we know the other side of Solomon, don't we? When it comes to wisdom. He didn't get stupid. You know, later on in life, when he got into that corruption, when he started marrying all the wives and built those, those temples on Mount Olivet, you know, it was, it was a mess. Do you think he lost his wisdom? No. See, that's where we have to look at it. Just because you may be wise at one moment, you can turn around and be a fool. You can still do the same thing. And Solomon was an example of both, where this man was blessed with tremendous wisdom, and God said, not only that, I'm going to give you everything else you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you money, I'm going to give you wealth, and he said, there will never be anyone wiser than you. Never again, and there hasn't been. But he sure was foolish, wasn't he? So there's, there's, there's kind of a both things. Just because you obtain it in one moment doesn't mean that you're going to have this wisdom forever. So let's kind of Simplify, let's peel it back a little bit, looking at this word wisdom. A simple definition, the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. So you have experience, knowledge, and good judgment. So you notice knowledge is just knowledge. It's just information. That's something that a lot of times, you know, you see people, they have a great amount of knowledge. They have PhDs, but they don't have good experience with it. I've seen students, you know, that would come out of a paramedic program, and oh my, man, you, they would sit down and start talking to me, and I'd look at them and go, man, you are a genius. I mean, they were talking about all sorts of different cardiac actions and simply all this stuff, and I'm looking at them going, wow, and I, was, I would get intimidated by them. I'm like, oh man, I, I don't know, they should put this kid with somebody else, let them mentor him, because this guy's really sharp. And then we'd get out there and get in the middle of a cardiac arrest or some major trauma, and they'd go, what? And afterwards, I'd go, what happened? And I, I didn't want to embarrass them, but it was like, it was humbling. That was the first thing next, after those bad calls, all of a sudden they'd look at you and they'd go, uh, uh, I said, that, that's called wisdom. <laughs> wisdom doesn't mean you're the smartest kid on the block. It means that you're able to take the knowledge you have, use the experience you have, and act. And that's why you can have a breakdown. That's why wisdom isn't bulletproof. A lot of times you can do it. Here's another kind of uh, definition I saw. The ability to consider and act using knowledge. I like that. To me, that starts to really explain the, the action, the dynamicness of it. And, and so let me read it all. Ability to consider and act using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. Take one of those out, you know, you don't have the experience and you have the knowledge. If you have experience but you don't have knowledge, it depends on what action you're trying to apply, doesn't it? I can have a lot of experience about certain medical aspects, but I'm not a doctor. 
I get into an emergency room, you know, and the doctor, emergency doctor looked at me and said, well, do you think we ought to do this? And I'm sitting there going, oh. I got a lot of knowledge about that. And I had a doctor one time, he did that. We walked in, he goes, I need, you know, would you go ahead and intubate, put a tube down this patient's airway? And I'm looking at him, I'm like, you're the doctor. And I didn't say it out loud, but he, he looked at me, he goes, uh, I'm not that, I haven't done it that many times. I'm a new doctor. And I was like, whoa, okay, I get it. I mean, he's got a medical degree, and he's got the same basic training of airway management and doing that task, but he never had done it in a real person. He'd done it so infrequently, and, and everybody said, well, paramedics, they do it all the time, so let's get them. But I almost threw it back at him, because I'm like, wait a minute, you have the knowledge, you're a much smarter person than me, and he is, I'm not, I'm not you know, running myself down, but he didn't have them both. He didn't have them both. Now, later on, you know, when you get into some of those old crusty docs, and they can do it with their eyes closed, you know, I mean, because now they have not only now the knowledge, but now they have the experience. That's where we want to go as Christians. But now what's your knowledge, see? Now that's what we have to do, and that's what James is going to talk about. So he's still talking in the context of teaching. I don't think he's moved too, way, too far away from it. It does stand on its own as a class. I mean, information. But he's talking about the tongue. He's talking about control and the influence that it has and the danger of it. He gave some great illustrations about it. And then he comes on over into chapter 3. And then he says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom. So that fits with what he's been talking about because... He just talked earlier about having deeds and faith, works, action, and faith. And what's the difference? Well, there's a big difference, James said. James said that, you know, faith is knowledge, and it comes from God, but then you do what those things tell you, what your faith explains and has educated you on. And how do you do it? Now, that's where as you grow from being an immature and a young Christian, you grow in wisdom. You start to learn how to take the words of God, how to apply that, to put it through experience, and you get stronger and stronger. So he's asking it kind of sarcastically, you know, kind of like poking back and saying, well, who among you is smart? Who are you guys? And I'll bet you there was one in every crowd. I am. Rich, young, young, the rich young ruler reminds me of that, you know, wherever, whenever he comes to Jesus and says, Lord, what great command should I do? And the Lord gives him a couple, and he goes, well, I do those. And then he, didn't Jesus got him, didn't he? Give up all your money. <laughs> Broke him. Broke him. So who among you is wise and understanding? That's, that's a point of starting the humility of this conversation, of humbling and saying, look, who honestly can proclaim themselves he just talked about the tongue and saying that there's no human. No human can control that tongue. And now he's talking about this idea of you think you're smart. And a lot of those that they were facing, those Christians, were, there were some because they were Jews and that they had this great knowledge of Mosaic Law felt like Phew, gospel is little information. I mean, come on, think about it. It's really simple information. Mosaic Law, whoo, man, there's a bunch of that stuff. Look at Leviticus. Look at Deuteronomy. I mean, come on, man. I know that stuff. Gospel, Jesus was born. He's the Savior. He died. He was buried. He was raised. And he, we had to be baptized for sin. Bam! So a lot of them, you could see where they had this great confidence and an entitlement. An entitlement. Because Abraham was our father. I have a genealogy that connects back to him. So I think this is a part of the conversation he's having with these readers but us as well no matter how confident we may feel when it comes to teaching preaching we also need to start and i have to ask myself ron are you really that wise are you really that understanding on every topic that we i, I teach I, I have to back up and stop and think about it because i can assume that i know this topic and when i do that i cut myself short when i just assume well this will be an easy lesson because i've taught it so many times and I catch myself, that's a little arrogant. That's a little bit thinking, well, you got it down now. No. And then I go and study, and I start putting that lesson together. I go, whoa, 
wow, 20 years and I've been talking about this and now I see this passage and I start to pull it together. So that's why I say I think James is opening this up by asking that very personal question. Who among you is wise and understanding? Okay, you are? Okay, so it's, I'm kind of playing with this. Play along with me. Okay, oh, so you are. Okay, then let's see it in the way that you're doing things. Notice that? Faith, actions, doing, not just talking. So let's see it. And the, how are we going to see it? Guess what? Everybody's going to see it. It's not something you can sit and say, well, l- l- give me an exam and I'll, I'll, I, can do the, I can do the exam. No, you see, that's the difference. You may have the knowledge of how to be living a good life. You may be able to write it down and quote it and write it down and everything. But no, this is where he's saying almost like the faith and action. If you're wise, then we're going to see your faith and your action in your good life. It's going to be evident. So that's why I say it's, it's a little bit you know, rhetorical because it's, it's kind of obvious. Those people who are living good lives, well, we know you. And the, those who aren't, we know you as well. So it's not something you can hide because your life is out there. So let it be shown by their good life, by deeds done in humility. And where does that come from? Where does all that good life come from? Wisdom. So how do you get a good life? How do you get this life that James is talking about? You know, by showing it, he says, by wisdom. Okay, now what is wisdom again? It's knowledge, and then it's practical application and experience while doing it. So that means I need to love my brother. Okay, I got that down. But then, have I, do I know how to do it? Have I, have I done it? How do I do it? How do I love my brother? So that's the part where, you know, where we start to say, well, our faith you know, meets the actual reality. And that's what he says. Humility. I love that. He puts that in there. Humility. Anyone who's sitting there thinking they're all wise and everything, one, your life just told on you. <laughs> your life just ratted you out, man. Because either it's going to say to everyone that's listening to this, no, John, you're not. <laughs> and, and it's probably be because you don't have humility. So the humility that comes from wisdom... Because that's one of the things that you find out. The older you get, the less you seem to know. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're getting dumber or you're getting dementia. It means that the more you get and the more you grow older, you realize how much more there is, right? And that maybe I don't know it all. That I've learned one thing is that I don't know it all. Like a parent. You know, at 30, I could have told every other parent how to raise a child. At 60, I don't have a clue. I feel like... Phew, for me to tell you, I don't know. I can, I can kind of tell you what I did, and I think that's the difference. Now I've gone through it. I have the knowledge, I have the experience, and now it just completely changed me, and it humbled me. <laughs> There's nothing more humbling than being a parent. Nothing. <laughs> Talk about knocking you to your knees, the struggles you have with your children. And it does stop there. Now i got grandchildren. And I see the same thing, my heart. You know, So that's what comes from a good life. It starts to reflect that. And then in 14, he says, but if you have bitter jealousy, now he shows you another application where you can look and go, this is whether I have the right wisdom or not. This is how you can look at a group of people and see how wise are they or not. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish, you notice the other was humility, it was humble, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, <laughs> demon. Would we say that somebody, okay, so okay, maybe I don't meet that definition or anything, and I have some selfish ambition. That's how dangerous, he says, jealousy and selfish ambition is demonic. It's so d- destructive, that type. Jealousy and selfish ambition. Now, I like what he says. It's kind of an interesting. Is do not boast and be false to the truth. Don't lie to yourself. If we go back to the previous verse. What did he say? He was saying it comes from humility. True wisdom 
Godly wisdom comes from that point that brings you into wisdom and, and humility. Because when you gain God's knowledge and you have the experience, it humbles you. And it will produce a good life without jealousy and without selfish ambition. So there's our test right there to think within ourselves. Are we maturing? Are we wise among ourselves? He said, that's not what comes down from heaven. So we have two types of wisdom, don't we? And that's where we come to really start to look at that we're going to look at. So in 16, then he says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. That's what happens when you take and just have the world's wisdom. You have chaos. I cannot but think about what's going on in our country. I just can't. When I, talk about, when I think about wisdom, you know, I don't want to get into the, the different social, economical, political, all that stuff, but when I see the actions of the news that's being reported, I have to wonder, where is the wisdom? Where is wisdom in those actions that are burning and killing and destroying? Where is that wisdom? Does that sound like wisdom that comes from above? That comes from a, a loving God? Or does that sound like somebody who has selfish ambitions and they're jealous? Jealousies. So we can start to apply that immediately, can't we? So that from heaven. So we know what worldly is. He starts to show it. But in 17, then he says, But wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Again, think about the decisions that we see people making and the actions in which they're involved and the fruit of their life. Because Remember, that's what he says. You know, that person who thinks they're wise, okay, let's go back to that because that's what he starts this whole conversation out. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let me show it. So let's say that. If you're wise, let's see what type of wisdom you're showing. Because your life is going to show it. Your actions are going to show it. And he says, but if you think you're wise, and he's talking about spiritual, godly wisdom, he said, then guess what? It's with humility. And then he shows us what type of wisdom that it's going to, what that type of wisdom is going to produce. It's going to be pure. It's not going to be defiled, hypocritical. It's going to be peaceful. It's not going to have any type of controversy or, or type of uh, adverse effects or trying to go over and run you over. It's gentle. It's, it's full of reason, open to reason. Where's that happening in our society? In families and jobs and everywhere. It's like, are you open to reason? And I hope that I am. I think I am. To at least try to listen because see that's what's going to win people to Christ people who proclaim to be Christians but yet they have worldly wisdom they're not bringing people to God what they're doing is they're pointing out that their, their faith and their religion is fake it's false because people aren't seeing it that's why people have to see real spiritual wisdom in us because they will first and foremost our, our life will betray us. It will talk about us to them. And it will say to people, are we peaceful? Are we pure? Are we open to reason? And that's going to pull people in. That's going to attract people to come to you. And then you're going to point them to God. The other? No. It's not. I go over to 1 Corinthians. I'd like to skip over there. and We'll wrap up this lesson, but... I think Paul does a great job of now tying that into the idea of the gospel and salvation over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because there's a lot of things that when we try to compare the type of wisdoms and the effects of that wisdom is where we get, I think, confused. And sometimes we even blur that line and not understanding. Because when we try to compromise our faith, because of peer pressure or something like that, what we're doing is really we're destroying. It's, like, it's almost like 
Wisdom can't be salty and fresh water. You know, you can't have two. You can't have a little bit of the world's wisdom and a little bit of God's wisdom. It's all polluted. It's just corrupt. And the, the problem that they were finding culturally is how do you take a, a group of people who have never heard of Yahweh and they are only familiar with Greek gods who abused humans, who looked down on humans, and that everything about a human was kind of lower class, and you did things for the gods. You know, and then you come along and you tell the story about how this one real true God had a son. Now, they were used to that because they had demigods, remember? So they were used to the idea of a demigod, a half god, half human. But I guarantee you, there's no way one of those Greek gods would have ever made a plan that would include one of their children dying. Dumbest thing they would have ever heard. It just would not make sense. Now, the apostles had the ability to perform miracles, and so that would catch their attention and probably help to pull them in. But the logic of it, think about it. What is, it, when you look at the world, every politically powerful regime, king, emperor, whatever, comes with a certain pedigree, certain level of power and prestige. How did this Jesus come? In a feed trough, from a tribe of no, no repute, you know, very humble, no education formally, a carpenter. So, Where's the wisdom in that? If you really want to get the respect and get people behind you, at least get a good education. Go to Gamaliel, you know, and get some training. At least have him come from something that's got good reputation. So everything about the way God is trying to bring the plan of salvation was not very wise to the world. And so as he's talking to them about the cliques that they were having and trying to set up Apollos and Paul and, you know, as the, we follow after them and this clique stuff, he then says, yet among the, the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Now, it's hard to teach somebody wisdom. How do you teach somebody wisdom if they don't have knowledge? Remember, wisdom also is a part of experience. And so that's a difficult thing. And he's saying, I, I can't really, you know, a young Christian who hasn't experienced life as a Christian yet, hasn't put their faith out there and been working it, you know, then we have to talk a little bit differently. Not dumbing it down, but, you know, there's a different way we have to talk to you. But there reaches a point, like the Hebrew writer said, yet while some of you should be teaching, you're back at the milk phase. You're still, you're still at the level that, of not growing at all. And he says, that's dangerous, right? Why? Because you can't tell the difference between what is true and what is false. You have a problem with that. I see that with Christians a lot. They, they're questioning some fundamental things that should not, it should be an, I, I think should be a no-brainer. No, that's not correct doctrine. No, that is not right. And I think, well, why are they doing that? Well, because they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the wisdom. They haven't put their faith out there. They haven't talked to somebody. They haven't had a conversation and engaged these ideas and been open and stuff. So he says that the wisdom that we're trying to share with you is something that's coming from heaven, basically. And it's not the one, you're going to look at the wise, the Plato, the Socrates. You know, you're not going to find it there. He said, this is the different. This is unique. And he reminds them of their mortality by saying, and all of them are going away. But the source he's kind of showing is, no, this wisdom that I'm talking to you, O Corinth, is something greater. And so jumping down to chapter 3, just so we don't go on all of it, he says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is, look at that, jealousy. Remember, that's back in James 2. James, not, I should say James also, <laughs> chapter 3. But look what he says, jealousy, quarreling among you. Are you not worldly then? Remember what James said. He said, you can tell a person by the product of their life and what type of wisdom that they're demonstrating. 
So when you see somebody that's quarrelsome, that's selfish, you can tell that they may be wise, but that's not a wisdom that comes from above. It's a wisdom that comes from the world. And we have to be so careful as Christians. Where are we wise? Where is our source? Where are we coming from? Are we truly taking God's word and applying it? And is our life truly reflecting the wisdom that comes from above? So that's our lesson for tonight. So as we go through this great little book, I hope that you'll continue to read it. Read ahead, read back, back up, bring it up. I mean, the more you read this, you'll see how this fits together so well for us today in this age. If there's somebody here with us this evening that we can help you in your relationship with Christ, I hope that you would let us know. If you need to be a Christian by being baptized, I hope that you as well would reach out and let us know. Let us share our plan of salvation with you. Think about these things while we stand and we sing.